Okay. So uh, first, I don't know if I need to introduce you. That's again. okay. <laughs> it's it's <just> okay. <laughs> hello, it's me again. <laughs> Hi, hello, Christina from Colombia. All right, here we go. Okay. Yeah, it's all right. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm back to back. I'm back here again. So thank you so much. This is my now formal presentation for this conference. Thank you again for Alliance HQE for the invitation, Tatimat, for everyone that is involved in this session. Uh, I am very happy to be here to give you an overview a little bit more deeper into the challenges and opportunities around decarbonization. Uh, I, that's why in the previous uh, conversation, I focused a little bit more on the European work of global of World GPC. So I'm happy here to share a little bit more of what World Green Building Council, but our partners, our Green Building Councils do. And for that, I think there's nothing better than to have them speak about it. So I'm happy here to share a video from our members from around the world. We do a yearly campaign called World Green Building Week. And this year's campaign was Building for Everyone. If I can get some help, can we get that video rolling? I can do that. Thank you. 
It's so lovely to have other people speak on our behalf. So I guess I could even stop the presentation there. What's the biggest challenge we have? The numbers are daunting and the figures are, are really, really pressing, right? The numbers of people that are today suffering from climate crisis, the numbers of people that are now at risk because of the climate emergency, but also the opportunities are people, our networks. The biggest opportunity is us, and we cannot be discouraged that that's, 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 that's our biggest asset. We cannot be discouraged with those stats because that's our biggest asset. So at World Green Building Council, we are catalyzing the uptake of sustainable built environments by, for everyone everywhere. And we have a, solistic, a holistic view on sustainability that is based on three pillars, climate action, health and well-being, and resources and circularity. And we are very proud to represent those 70 green, over 70 green building councils around the world because together we are leading the decarbonization and sustainability agenda of the built environment. We have over 60 partner organizations beyond the 70 GPCs, and of course, including, for example, the Global Alliance for Building and Construction that is with us today. Those are the three impact areas. And an important thing of our network is that our network of green building councils is aligned behind this vision of having emissions by 2030 and taking action on key areas under those three mega trends on sustainability in the built environment. So where do we stand? As you can see, those numbers speak a little bit for themselves. As I said, we face a tremendous challenge with the built environment responsible for almost 40% of global energy related emissions. We can no longer just talk about building better, more sustainable built environments. Of the climate pledges that are done through the UN process of the UN CCCC, um, and 192 climate pledges, only 80 have adopted or said they have adopted energy codes. And for those countries that are still building at a fast rate, sometimes there is even lacking energy codes. So we are lacking in ambition and lacking in regulation. And in areas where we expect that growth, I said, there's almost no mandatory codes at all. So we are far away from meeting the Paris Agreement in this sector without embracing the diversity of the world and the challenges. So we must together through that collaboration that I was speaking about in the past session also to have emissions by 2030. And that I'm going to go deeper into that because the topic of today. So in 2018, 2017, actually, to respond to those, to the Paris Agreement, the World Green Building Council launched Advancing Net Zero Program. So working with Green Building Councils across our network, we have developed tools, programs, and resources to promote the urgency and achievability of net zero carbon buildings. And of course, what we were talking, building capacity in the industry to achieve this vision. Advancing net zero whole life carbon, we were also we kind of falling into place with the previous session. Advancing net zero whole life carbon requires us to address both the principles of operational carbon, and by that I mean the emissions that come from heating, cooling, 
lighting and powering our buildings and addressing embodied carbon, the emissions with the materials and construction processes, particularly before the building is used, known as upfront carbon, but also during the building's lifetime, and the combined whole life carbon approach. Is that seen? It's a little bit light. Okay. The combined whole life carbon approach must consider the effects of one on the on the uh, on the other. For example, the choice in construction materials affects the performance or the building's energy consumption. So what we've done through the program is established best principle, best practice principles, sorry, for optimizing performance and reducing emissions from both these sources. And starting with a reduction first principle. So the principles are in that slide. The operational, which is on the left hand side of the slide, means the principles means that we for reducing energy consumption through energy efficiency measures. And then we can meet the remaining energy needs from renewable energy, either on site or off site. And for any residual emissions that we cannot deal with, for example, on site use of fossil fuels, that should be compensated or accounted for. We cannot go away with the residual emissions. And all buildings should have a plan for deep decarbonization. So what does that mean? We're talking about transitioning to fossil fuel free energy where and, and that should be a, a, a primary thinking in this industry. For embodied carbon, again, the principles are reduction first uh, approach, prevent embodied carbon in the first place by maximizing opportunities to renovate existing buildings before choosing to build new. So if you have a building, think about it before knocking it down. It has a huge carbon debt to pay. It possibly can be renovated. So success in this industry is not just building and building. It's about using what we've already built. And then after that thinking, you can make low carbon design and material choices, such as uh, what we we're talking about before, modular construction. Of course, make your, your building site all electric and procure using life cycle analysis low carbon materials. Of course, we need to plan for the future, optimizing opportunities for the building reuse and adaptation, and of course, future disassembly. And that will need a lot of information. It's usually called a materials passports. And finally, we need to start thinking on how are we going to account and act on the residual emissions, uh, because uh, decarbonizing the build environment is going to be hard, and we need to be fully accountable for all the emissions. So our vision at World GBC for a net zero whole life carbon is fast becoming an imperative from our sector. We've been very lucky to have the building life program mainstream in the European context. And in order to adequately address emissions and create sustainable and resilient built environments, it means the following. Now I'm supposed to read the slide and I'm far away, so I'm going to go closer. <laughs> so mainstreaming means leadership, right? Join the net zero carbon buildings commitment from World GBC. We have a vision by 2030 and uh, to achieve that all existing buildings should be reducing their energy consumption and, el and eliminating all emissions from energy and refrigerants. By 2030, all new developments and major renovations should achieve reductions, maximum reductions in embodied carbon. The information is there. Uh, by 2030, all buildings globally should be at least having 40% less embodied and should be net zero in operational carbon. And these goals actually are embedded in the Marrakesh Partnerships Climate Action Pathways for the Human Settlements for Built Environments. And of course, uh, this is aligned with a 1.5 degree scenario, and of course, by 2050, whole life net zero whole life carbon will be will be hopefully the mainstream that we need. For this to happen, you saw that we need many approaches uh, to make sure we get there. But I think this 
what we propose at World GBC is a good a leadership initiative to get going. And green building councils from all around the world are developing, as I said, tools, resources, and educating their members on how to deliver on net zero buildings at scale and what the application of this vision means for the market. We were having a question on harmonization, but different markets have different visions depending on their local context, and that's the reality of the world. But the good thing is that through the World GBC collaboration, we know how to leapfrog and make others in this journey be more successful to address those challenges. And so we have a dozens of examples of pioneering research, roadmaps, rating tools, education series, training programs, events, guidance that are available to equip the building and construction sector globally with the tools to embrace this transition to a decarbonized built environment. So unfortunately, or fortunately for you, there's not enough time for me to go through all that detail, but I would say that go to Alliance HQE. They have this great roadmap called a pathway to decarbonize by 2050 uh, uh, the country. It's part of our Building Life Initiative. It was published just this last May, and it has guidance on low carbon renovations, a framework for circular economy, and promoting a holistic approach and solution for how to go around uh, this, this great topic, but in a very pragmatic and clear and technically uh, you, you cannot get the best, the best technical guidance is available through our networks. As you've heard, we have 36,000 members around the world and World GBC and its members are collaborators by nature. By nature, we are not competitive. We acknowledge what everyone does and we're here to celebrate your success and give you tools because what we desperately need is for you to use them. I'm gonna do a little pause here. Why is decarbonization not happening? I think it's lack of will. Everything is out there. Roadmaps, tools, solutions, systems, analysis, this and that. Why is it not happening? Lack of, lack of, oh, there must be something weird in what they're saying. No, 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 no. We're done. We want people to embrace this vision and I hope regulators will help us for those that are not convinced to be convincing you in a harsher way because there's no, there's no excuse. Why won't you be embracing something that delivers high quality, that is good for planet and good for people? I'm done. All right. So the Net Zero Carbon Buildings Commitment is a great initiative, as you have you've heard. It was a pioneering work from World GBC. At 2017, World GBC started talking Net Zero, and we got many eyebrows raised. Funders were not that prevalent. We now have more support. We now have over 200 signatories from around the world, which is great, great stuff because it's cities, businesses acting on operational and embodied emissions. It's important for me to say that we started the net zero carbon buildings commitment through an operational pathway. Now it's whole life carbon commitment. So the companies in here are disclosing whole life carbon impacts and they're committed to advancing net zero by 2030, much more ambitious than the halving of the emissions that we know from the Paris Agreement. So they, these people, we have case studies, we have their names, we have what they're doing in our website. They are leadership, accelerating industry transformation, creating more demand, decarbonizing their own portfolios through their business activities. Why wouldn't you act in the biggest business opportunity that is net zero? There's loads of more leading companies in this space. There must be something that is crucial that if you're not in this, if you're not, if you're not in this road, we are promoting through the commitment, crucial climate action, demonstrating that actions and ambitions on the ground are taken forward. And lastly, I am from South America, from Colombia, even the city of Cali from Colombia, which is a small town, has signed the committee. And there is a pathway for decarbonization in Colombia that the Colombia Green Building Council launched this year, but supported by the World Resources Institute. So even countries that haven't been responsible for emissions know that the future is low carbon and that it is good for their economies, for their people 
to embrace a non-polluting solution to this sector. Of course, achieving the vision is tough because we want it to be totally decarbonized. It kind of feels like the goalposts move, no? First we said operational, now embodied, now whole life, now circularity, but hold. Achieving that totally decarbonized vision that is also resilient, equitable. Uh, it cannot happen overnight, we know, but we're on it. It's really interesting in the, in the work we've been uh, doing with many actors, including the high-level climate champions and the Building to COP coalition. Uh, we are very rooted into what's called this ambition loop because it is not the responsibility or the gift of one stakeholder. It's actually a very broad value chain that has to be moving in this direction. Every actor has a role to play as we get closer to the goals. So if one actor takes a step forward, let's say regulation, it mutually reinforces, for example, the leadership by industry. And then I, as a leader, I do a bit more. I'm anticipating regulation or the regulation is catching up and then it reinforces. What does it mean? Leadership shows it can, you can do better, regulation catches up. Then the leaders say, I can do better, the regulation catches up. And then we're getting closer to having a reinforcing system that can recognize that it's not only front runners in the business taking risks to do better portfolios that are, that are decarbonized, but actually they, by addressing their own emissions and being ambitious, and moving to net zero, they're giving a strong policy signal. So for those regulators, that that's the direction of travel of industry, that that red road here is mainstream. It's not a little bit. And then we are, will be closer to creating more confidence in the investor industry to transition, sorry, more confidence in the investor industry to pick and hopefully only invest in low carbon solutions because my hope and the hope of the system is that those that are not fit for purpose do not attract capital because that's the other way where we can discriminate and make sure that the sustainable finance movement enables this ambition loop because we need more confidence to for that wheel to turn at a faster pace and of course, that means also that the policy frameworks and the public procurement policies must be, let's say, aligned to increase demand. And again, greater uptake, greater demand, lower cost, because here right now, after so many years of sustainable buildings, there's no cost premium in doing things better. Everything is just out there. It's just a matter of choice early on in the design phase, and it can be done. So. The good news is that we're also seeing great examples in that ambition loop in, in action. So one example is green building councils support the supply chain in gearing up for enhanced regulation, for example, through training programs and awareness raising campaigns. Com companies are also achieving carbon neutral developments and portfolios, and of course, building retrofit schemes that are emergently globally to addressing energy efficiency uh, uh, much better. If you like, and we had a forum just last June uh, celebrating the 20 years of World UBC, and when we went through actions that can happen right now that there's no barrier, we usually say for energy efficiency, it is the golden rule for net zero. Why? Use less, don't use fossil fuel energy. And then we're on the right road. There's much more to it in the sector, but that's, that's just common sense. In, in, the, in, in today's world, common sense in prices surging. No, it's like, oh yeah, right, energy efficiency first. The other uh, uh, part of the wheel is cities and subnational and national governments, not only as policymakers. These actors have huge public building stock and are setting targets, they must uh, set targets to address their own emissions. So they create more demand. And of course, they can then commit by being consistent to have better policy interventions. And finally, signs of finance, of the finance and investment community, being focused and asking on disclosure of data 
to move capital towards low carbon development and the, and the solutions that enable the energy transition. This is going to be a key theme at COP27, and I know you will be following closely. Let me go a little bit into the energy transition. According to IRENA, IRENA is the International Renewable Energy Agency, over 90% of the solutions shaping a successful outcome in 2050 involve renewable energy through direct supply, electrification, energy efficiency, green hydrogen and bioenergy, combined with cap carbon capture and storage. And as in those five themes that Irina mentions, the built environment plays a significant role in energy efficiency, in renewables, and electrification, meaning that the built environment can contribute to more than half of the measures to be on track to net zero. The investments needed for that energy transition will have to increase by 30% over the planned investments between now and 2050 to be like over 131 a trillion in US dollars assets. And the payback will be at least $61 trillion by 2050. There will be sharp adjustment in the climate, uh, in the climate uh, capital flows. And there will be investments being reoriented to align to energy systems that have a positive economic and environmental trajectory. The built environment is not in that positive economic and environmental trajectory. So it's a sector at risk of, of being put down or having more risk premiums. So as the energy transition goes, there will be jobs created in clean energy. And we know that the energy sector will create at least 122 million jobs by 2050. And that's renewable energy jobs alone accounting for a third roughly. As we see a holistic global policy framework move to countries to commit to the transition, that means that that finance will be looking into capacity and technologies and the built environment is critical to enable also that renewable transformation. So we are part of that conversation and there's at least three simple components in relation to the built environment and every building that must be designed today for those outcomes to be aligned with the climate goals and the needs of the energy transition. So one, what can you do today? Reduce your carbon emissions and improve your energy efficiency. As I said, energy efficiency, golden rule to net zero. This of course applies to other sectors such as transport, but energy efficiency in buildings is one of the most cost effective ways to reduce emissions. And if we would have done that in the building sector, we wouldn't have, be having this gas crisis because it would be better building stock, not needing that much energy. Second, optimizing and securing local energy systems. What do I mean by that? Buildings in urban areas can be connected, right, to district and urban scale renewable energy grids. So sharing surplus on-site energy generation with neighbor buildings, buildings can become prosumers. And then we're part of the energy transition opportunity and the creation of jobs. Third, the production of low carbon energy. Buildings can be at scale producing renewable energy and also as they produce more renewable energy and address lower demand by energy efficiency, it means that we're aligned toward the path towards net zero. And that is what the, the, the Green Building Councils through Advancing Net Zero Program in our framework are talking about. So if you want specific solutions for your markets, for France, here's Alliance HQE. And uh, I'm happy, of course, to take uh, questions later on. But what I'm saying, the opportunities are big and are connected. So I invite you to go to World GBC's website to, to have more resources. We have several papers. One is a, a, a great output we had in the middle of the pandemic. I think we were very productive in, 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 in the first phase when we didn't know what this shock would, would mean. But we put out a health and well-being framework in 2020 
that's called um, the health and well-being framework, redefining the principles for a healthy, sustainable built environment. That's one. Second, at COP26, we launched in the blue zone two reports. One is called Beyond Buildings, which is basically saying have a systems approach to community scale solutions. It's not one building at a time. The community scale is very important. And sometimes we in our industry get hooked up in the, in the building. That's not it really. We need an integrated approach and we're putting out there some thought leadership on that, which there's more from the rating tools of GBCs. They have community scale solutions or an integrated way to, to speak to other, other parts of, of the infrastructure. And um, I mentioned the EU policy roadmap that was uh, published in May of this year, calling for action on whole life carbon, that I already said a little bit what's in there, it's published there. And what I, I'm just flagging here is the experience and work of our partners, our Green Building Councils, and their 36,000 plus members to set out this deep rooted technical vision for the built environment to make sure we have leadership and front runner action so we are not signal that we're just talking talking no we have examples of people doing stuff we have 200 examples of people in case studies doing significant work portfolios at scale advancing advancing i mean by advancing is bringing forward the dates of the paris agreement to make sure that by 2030 we are showing the silver linings of what can happen and of course embracing responsible and sustainable development for people and planet because from the region of the world i am from we are our building stock is yet to be built mostly and most of the world right now over four billion people are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change and the built environment is part of the challenge as you've heard and the solution as I mentioned, the built environment contributes to almost 40% of globally, uh, global, global energy related emissions. And so there's a huge opportunity for leaders to join the United Nations Race to Zero and Race to Resilience campaigns that have been gaining traction at, at, the, at the climate conference of COP. Both of these initiatives work both with businesses and governments to drive deeper climate action in the built environment. And as part of the Race to Resilience campaign, World GBC has been supporting this year. It's just starting, but it's called Roof Our Heads campaign. Because we have been talking a bit about big challenges, and this is another big one, which is harder to put your hands on. So it's a campaign towards empowering women leaders in informal settlements around the world closely affiliated with Slum Dwellers International and supported by the UN High Level Climate Champions, because I believe, and we have been witnessing the, 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 in, 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 in developing countries, some cities are not built formally. Some cities, at least half, are built informally because the scale of production doesn't match up to the urbanization trend. So people go into cities, or either there's not good quality jobs, they don't find a home, they can't pay for it. People don't just end living in the street, they figure out how to live, even though, and that's how slums get created. So today, the figure is 1 billion people around the world live in informal settlements. There is no climate agreement, there's no Paris agreement, if we don't get our hands a little bit messy and deal with informal settlements and help out, because because <laughs> this number is set uh, is out to double. By 2050, if we don't do nothing, 90% of the increase in informal settlements will be happening in Asian African towns and Latin American towns. Meanly, meaning that we're 1 billion, it will be 2 billion urban dwellers that will require housing, basic services that are resilient to climate change. So we talked a lot of solutions right now, right? Great. I think I hope I met your expectations of the technical. However, we need to be generous and we need to be empathic with the people that are suffering right now. So we need you to help out. We may not know how to work with these people, but we know how to partner and we could do guidelines to help them with basic ABCs of how could they improve their homes 
if others help out and collaborate to find the funding and the collaboration. So this is a, a shout out because of the world we live in. We talk about systemic change, right? And we talk, I talked about um, collaboration, but actually the sort of initiatives that you could just be tweeting about it, caring about it, flagging to others that may act about it is trying to, at the human scale, bring the finance, the design, the construction and the governance to try to help these women on the ground. So reach out to me if this resounds with you. I can connect you with the right people if you want to be part of this, this campaign and what's its outcomes. All right, so the opportunities I've been discussing form a larger picture. What is that larger picture? A global built environment movement. In 2021, World GPC and a global group of built environment leaders wrote a letter to the COP26 presidency asking for a built environment day at COP26. And our request was accepted. And we held the first cities, regions, and built environment day since COP21 in Paris. The event was, I would say, a phenomenal success. And this was because we worked together. Hmm? Forget me. We work together. I want to make a moment to share experience with you in the following video, because I think uh, it, will, it will make you want to be a part of what we're building here. So we can't achieve the 1.5 goal unless we think about the three primary sectors that drive uh, emissions. Energy, transport, and buildings. Indeed, buildings of the building environment is critical in order for us to be able to drive our carbon emissions down. Leadership at every level and deep collaboration are the antidote to overcome the challenges of an historically fragmented and siloed sector. We are celebrating a thousand and forty million cities joining the city's race to zero. In 2020, in our NDCs, we have established that 100% of new buildings will reduce between 20 and 45 percent its energy and water consumption by 2030. From the standpoint of getting to net zero, we need our cities and our communities to establish building codes and directives that, that raise the bar. We know that net zero is not good enough. It's a time to act now. It's not just the governments who are reacting. It's not just the corporates who are reacting. We have to have a deeper collaboration with our own citizens, with our people. The corporates are saying that we have to do all right so you saw there the website building to cop.org this year at the Egyptian COP27 presidency has shared their priorities for this conference and you, uh, if you're following this, uh, you may know about them, but it's about around adaptation, mitigation, climate finance and collaboration and they're also calling it the implementation COP. Show me what you're doing. This COP will be against a dramatic backdrop of economic turmoil and we will need to demonstrate <laughs> a willingness to take action implement solutions toward accelerating climate justice, solutions for reducing emissions at scale and addressing a critical uh, topic in the developing countries agenda. And it's been in the, or hasn't been in the agenda of the UNFCCC for 30 years is loss and damage. And so uh, the presidency is wanting to have it. And that's a tough one uh, to have success on. The building to COP uh, coalition will be there and uh, we will be representing the global building and construction sector 
and its role as solutions provider to these challenges. We will be demonstrating examples of action and implementation with the hope of putting people back at the heart of a low carbon and resilient built environment. We will be hosting official events at a COP27, both in the what's called the blue zone, which is the UN accredited, accredited zone and the green zones, supporting the Marrakesh partnerships for climate actions on human settlements. There will be a dedicated buildings pavilion from Global ABC, and we will be at World GBC announcing new guidance and initiatives aiming to deliver solutions for the sector. We, of course, this is done through good comms and sharing examples from stakeholders of what's happening around the world to accelerate this transition. So why, why, why do this huge effort? I think it's necessary to inspire that we are ready and that we are willing as a sector for enhanced regulation by policymakers, that we're ready to address emissions from this sector, but not only saying, oh yeah, low carbon a little bit. No, we have a huge responsibility. How are we going to walk the talk? And of course, create opportunity, jobs, to create uh, solutions, even for those most underserved segments of the population worldwide. We know we, did, we need desperately more collaboration and action. We're just getting started. But I know that through collaborative efforts, we have really, I am I'm an optimist, I know, possibly, but we have a realistic chance of meeting the Paris Agreement and keeping the 1.5 degree scenario within reach. If we do have these conversations around uh, industry, governments, subnational governments, and the financial community to figure this out quickly and scale the decarbonization of assets worldwide. So, I hope, um, I hope that as a world, 89% of the world supposedly has a net zero goal, 89%, that's a stat, 89% of the world economy has, has net zero commitment. Hmm? However, we know that their plans are not fit for that commitment. So we want to keep the world and the sector accountable. And um, yes, I hope that inspired a little bit of our flavor and our call on what's the risks and opportunities. I think to sum up a little bit, the opportunities are massive. The risks are growing badly. <laughs> so it's how, how do we make this sector really a climate solution provider instead of just sticking, I'm, I'm up to here, just saying the same stat about the emissions of the sector from energy demand. What, what different stat can we have in a few years? Can we have a building sector that is the, the, the one that is enabling the renewable energy transition? Can we have a building sector that is enabling employment and a job transition in areas that don't have solutions? I'm interested in those kind of conversations and hopefully uh, not repeating the same statistic in the next few years. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. Are there questions from the web? No. So questions in the, in this room. Wow, so so clear. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no questions. Yeah. Okay, maybe during your think of uh, another question. Uh, may I, I have no question. I just wanted to to make a remark. Can you uh, show the the slide uh, where you show the slum? The, the the city in the and then in at the front there is a big slum okay it's just a remark and maybe a question for you uh some months ago i read a study uh, maybe from architects from urgency mm -hmm. uh, they say of course what you see here is not what we want to 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 have mm -hmm. nevertheless they made a study and they have shown that in terms of urban morphology this is optimized by people. Of course, they are very uh, bad materials, and this is not satisfactory. But maybe the, there is worse. If the uh, decision makers at national or uh, city level decide to erase this and build another city made of uh, concrete blocks or bars at 50 kilometers, and the people cannot live in this 
new city because this is not at all adapted to what they accept uh, uh, what they ex uh, sorry what they expect and how they want to live because they cannot work in these new cities they cannot have agriculture or or some cattle or whatever because this is not very obvious but this has been optimized by the people who did this so I think, uh, what do you think? Maybe you, in your mission, you have also to 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 explain that uh, a very very uh, brutal solution arising everything and constructing something else is very bad. But now, it has explain, been done. No, been done. let me explain a little bit what this is about, mm -hmm. because I'm not yes, bulldozing. I'm sure. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's no. it's about the following. Most of the people that are come up with these solutions usually our women usually want to improve the quality of their homes but if there are fathers still there uh -huh. they're out trying to work uh -huh. and they're usually it's women in here with their kids trying to figure it out we have a series of problems with this if if the construction industry let's say if could grow in capacity to there's there's several phenomena here first population is growing, is migrating to cities at a faster rate than the formal building construction industry can deal with one. Second, economies may be not that strong. And then you don't have you don't have formal employment, but it seems to be better that you go to a city to find opportunity than in the rural area. And and possibly they get to the city and they cannot go into the formal system of employment. They don't have the education and then we are set up with this then from a policy standpoint, I don't believe this is optimized for several reasons and that there's there are serious stats from cities behind it, because if you would provide better planned temporary housing, that would even be better from a health perspective for the children, sanitation would be in place, at least, and the air quality would be a little bit addressed. And if you allow this, demarginalizing communities from a policy standpoint, from the fiscal standpoint, is at least from the studies I know, 30 to 40 percent more expensive than if you do things right from the start. So there's a policy problem here, and there's a human problem. So what the campaign does is let's work with women that are now. I'm, I'm not. We're not dealing with a problem because it's 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 jurisdictions have, is with the best information we have help the women that are living in those communities to empower them to improve yeah. the quality of these informal settlements. Mm -hmm. If possible, if there's tenancy rights, help them deal with it. Let's improve the situation. It's rough and we are not ready, mm -hmm. but this is the world and we cannot just pay blind sight. Sometimes we walk in cities and there's people that are suffering. What I'm saying here, I don't have all the answers. But this is something we, as an industry, cannot continue to be blind to. Yeah. Sure. No, but we understand each other. What I mean, optimized. I don't think that this is satisfactory. But the the people know what they what they want and how to optimize. But they know they want better. Yeah, yeah. They want better. They want but better they because their yeah, children yeah, yeah. don't have work. They're sick. Mm -hmm. They don't mm -hmm. have water. There's yeah, no sanitation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. right. Question. Just a question on the, the, the net zero objective, which yes. we all share, of course. Um, is the GBC also working on uh, in-between objectives at sector level, both for the industry and for the operational carbon side? Um, and also working on how to monitor those, uh, this roadmap locally. Is it part of GBC, local GBC's job to monitor the, the sector carbon road, local roadmaps and if no who, who does that because it's uh, <laughs> essential yeah so i guess there there are several the the pathways i think the decarbonization roadmaps that we were mentioning that the gbc's are doing on the building life campaign in the european context are what you're asking for but we believe the climate science is the climate science and the goalposts move. So the, the, the goal is to contribute by halving emissions by 2030. Yeah, there's not a negotiable interim target. 
there could be you could think of of actions that by 2025 can enable the sector to be on track towards that vision and i guess those are around a improving the quality of the uptake on energy efficiency and renovation rates. It is about empowering circular economy solutions. It is about a, making sure that the finance community enables better decision and scales up this at a pace and, and scale that is needed. The role of GPCs, we're, we're translators, we're facilitators. I hope I had all the databases and mandated GP. No, we are the members of our members or the partners usually do have solutions and the database and, and, and the, let's say, more empowered communities to have the right metrics. From our perspective, what we facilitate is that dialogue on where should we put our attention and make sure that our pathways and, our, and, and, and the initiatives that come together are as aligned and, um, and, let's say, that makes sense together for the industry to understand what are we talking about and where to look. Because right now there's a little bit of confusion, so I think what we work is to make sure that the industry is looking in the right direction, they find the answers. But we, we don't... Okay. Yeah, one more, one more. Yeah. Hi, Christina. <clears throat> Do you think that the, the current uh, tension linked to the war in Ukraine will, um, uh, will uh, slow down even more effective action and the, the lack of will you highlighted will have a new al alibi again? I think it can push us to... Well, I've Best heard, action. I've heard, for example, companies in Europe with a situation now that from their boards, they have greater buy in in the energy efficiency agenda in their in their in their operations, because it reduces cost. And in the inflationary context, if they don't start working on addressing their own operations, they will have to be translating their pricing to consumers. And to be viable, they have to also be making more productive their internal operation. That's from a company standpoint. From a more broader standpoint, I would say that it's a, like it sounds like COVID. No, let's not waste this crisis. Uh, it sounds like this crisis could have been deeply uh, the energy poverty we're we're thinking is going to happen in the next few months could have just been avoided with the right incentives for renovation rates to be at scale as we've been talking for many years. Uh, it seems that there is a willingness to drive forward. The attention, of course, is scattered around the economic turmoil. Uh, but there is, again, the opportunity to understand that energy efficiency will, if, if, not, if not taken up seriously now, you how how can countries manage another crisis next year by continuing to subsidize consumption and waste energy? Sounds common sense, but politicians sometimes are not common sense. We have a question coming from a student from the webinar. Uh, will carbon neutrality not be a break for developing countries uh, because these countries need industry, transport, uh, agriculture, and some yeah, development? Of course. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I think there's it's, it's very interesting because it, you can t look at sustainable development Sustainable development helps us avoid that extreme uh, because it is about we wish for everyone to have prosperity, development and address the, let's say, the, the, the needs for, for, for human growth, but not at the expense of the planet and its resources. And I guess developing countries are realizing now that if they go on, on the low carbon pathway, even though they're not responsible for emissions, that will deliver for them a cleaner economy that is more resilient. If they are carbon intensive now and depend on fossil fuels in a world that is shifting the energy systems, they will be possibly be out of business in a few years. So it's tracking the energy transition, the renewables, let's say, revolution, and empowering in a way that, it, let's say, creates opportunity, leapfrogging technologies. And for example, I've heard countries that are uh, even deciding to stop letting um, natural gas be specified for new buildings so not go let's incentivize renewables now let's not go into a technology that will be let's say non-competitive in a few years 
And that's not against development. I think it creates more, the, the green economy creates more opportunities for, for, for resource conservation in many countries that are resource intensive or resource generous. They, they, are, they have abundant resources. All right, with that, I think I'm on time. You are on time. Yeah. Thank you so much for your attention. It's been a pleasure. And I'll be around a, a few more hours. So thank you so much. There we go. Yeah, oh, we got it.